Hey, happy Aloha Friday. I'm Stan, the energy man, Stan Osterman from Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technology, State of Hawaii. Here to do a Stan, the energy man show today with some uh, a great guest, good friend of mine, wingman, also uh, one of my favorite aviators. He flew over in his his personal personal plane today just to be on the show. So, so Think Tech Hawaii spends no spares no expense to bring their guests on. They make them fly their own airplanes and pave their own way over. But anyway, we have a great show today. And just to start off with things, uh, last week we had Hans Kroc on here talking about OTEC. And he made a point that, that I wanted to bring back again today with my stray voltage minute. And that is, you know, when you start working with OTEC, you're dealing with thermal changes in a fairly small area. They're dealing with thermal changes in less than a half a mile of water that can give them enough thermal difference to generate power that the air where you see thunderstorms develop and, and we talked about all that energy that's in thunderstorms and weather takes thousands of feet to, to, to make that same kind of temperature change. But in the ocean, it's just a few hundred feet and you're down in water cold enough to make the temp temperature change to do an energy uh, generation project. So think about that. We're surrounded by really deep water, especially off the Waianae coast and it would be really easy to do OTEC, and that's a base load energy that would be great for Hawaii. So think about that. So today's guest is Paul Pontio from Blue Planet Research on the Big Island, and uh, he's here today to talk about what they're doing on the Big Island and uh, what we can expect to see in the future over there, and I work closely with them as much as he'll let me um, to, to figure out what we can do to help him. And he gives me a lot of good ideas and good thoughts and helps share uh, good uh, contractors and good equipment with me so I know what to do for the state of Hawaii and for the Air Force and our projects. So Paul, welcome to the show and it's great to have you here. Thanks Dan, it's a pleasure to be here. Hey. Thanks for having hey, me. Tell us a little bit about you know your background and, and what qualifies you to be the hydrogen expert that you are <laughs> that I admire so much. That's a good question. Uh, my background is actually, um, when I was young I was a machinist, so I did a lot of machine work and metal work, um, did a lot of construction work and then eventually became an architectural designer and worked in architecture here in Hawaii for about 20 years. Uh, eventually I met uh, Hank Rogers and went over to the Big Island when he had just purchased a new ranch and went there to help him do some architectural work. And the first thing we wanted to build was a workshop. So little did we know it was going to take two years to get permitted uh, going through the zoning department and the planning department. But after two years, we finally got construction going. We had planned on doing solar on the building from day one, so we were going to do a net metering agreement. And it was uh, such a, a hassle dealing with the utility on the Big Island. Uh, we rethought things and decided to just go off-grid. So we took the building off-grid and put in batteries, and we can talk about that after, but um, basically after knowing Hank for a few years, we became friends, and he asked me if I would stay on and do energy work and renewable energy. Outstanding. So. And so I've, I've had the privilege of seeing your shop several times. In fact, I'm almost qualified to give the tour myself. <laughs> I think you there. are. <laughs> but, um, but we're going to kind of walk through that uh, in the second segment of the show today and talk about the different pieces and parts that are in there. And we'll look at some pictures. We brought some pictures with us from there. We don't have your new electrolyzer in there, but we have the old one, which is still pretty nice looking. Okay. But, um, but the whole concept of going off the grid kind of scares a lot of people. But kind of, kind of tell us how you think about, um, you've got like 10 buildings off the grid on the Big Island. Um, but let's take it down to a house. Mm -hmm. If you were designing a house and you're an architect and you wanted to design it, to be the perfect off-the-grid house. What are some of the things that you'd be thinking about? Well, nowadays you would look at designing the house from the get-go to be as energy efficient as possible. <clears throat> Air condition typically accounts for anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of the electrical load. So if you can minimize the air conditioning, use very efficient air conditioning, or do without it altogether, it makes it a lot easier. LED lighting, Energy Star appliances, things that can keep the loads down uh, as little as possible. But what we've found on the Big Island through our experiences being off-grid is that you can actually do it in a more optimized way with software controls. So, for example, 
everything doesn't have to turn on at once that's automatic, your hot water heater. And this is also key in smart grid technology as well, where the utilities control the demand and response mm -hmm. by controlling certain appliances like that. So you don't necessarily need to have your hot water heater on while you're also drying clothes in the right. dryer or okay. you're cooking on the stove. So kind of controlling the peak load in there too. Calling your own peak load. So that way you minimize the amount of generation as well as storage that you need. And it makes the system more efficient and it keeps the cost down. Great. So I've, I asked somebody last week that I was talking to about the possibility of making a dual system in your house, like a DC for lighting and things like that, mm -hmm. and maybe even having your outlets where your 110 outlet right next to it had a USB, a string of USB ports, so when you went to charge your cell phone or something, instead of plugging in an AC-DC mm -hmm. inverter to go to your cell phone, you just plug it into a USB that's right there. Is, is that something that's reasonable or...? Yeah, it is. I mean, most people don't realize, but 90% of our electrical equipment and appliances in the house, we convert them back to DC. Um, in addition, things like LED lighting, which requires very little energy, we run 14-gauge copper Romex cable all over the house to run a 7.5-watt light bulb That's sometimes. Right? That is kind of I was in Okinawa in February at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, and they have a 19-house faculty housing project that is a high-voltage DC microgrid. And they share energy and they share storage in real time between each house. Mm. So, for example, if your house was running low and I had excess energy that particular night or day, it would just automatically flow to you. So everyone supports each other. In addition, they had a very small AC inverter for only the appliances that had to run on AC still. But their air conditioning was DC. Wow. So it was very efficient, and I think everyone in the industry agrees the future is going to be DC instead of AC for most homes and microgrids. Okay, so what, what would be the reason at all to continue using AC in a house? I mean, is there an advantage like when you have heavy motors or big, like a big motor, is that a, an AC advantage over DC or is there any advantage at all? It, not necessarily. The, there, there aren't really any advantages. Um, it's mostly we're, we're still dealing with legacy equipment. There isn't a lot of DC appliances, there aren't a lot of DC appliances available yet. Okay. So we're, we're getting there. We started with lighting. Um, in Europe, they're manufacturing products that actually run on DC direct. So you lose that, or you gain that lost conversion of energy, which, which adds up over time. Yeah. So when you're actually doing the conversion, you lose energy too, right? Right. Yeah. So, so instead of uh, starting off with AC power, converting it back and forth, at some point you see us migrating to a DC uh, inside the walls of your house kind of yeah. circuit. Yeah, and it would also minimize the cost of construction because your sure. wiring would be so much smaller. Right. Yeah, yeah and, and like you, I have a construction background too, and you're running 14 gauge and 12 gauge wire through the house for your 20 amp and 15 amp circuits, and yeah. you don't need that much for DC. Yeah. Especially nowadays, everyone goes out to Costco and buys LED lights. And right. They actually have a transformer in them to convert it to DC, but they only draw, you know, 7 to 20 watts each. So the wiring is just overkill. Okay. So Hawaii, you know, we always tell people that Hawaii is the perfect place to, to do research and development for, for renewable energy. And, you know, Blue Planet, obviously, you do the research on the Big Island. What are some of the advantages that you see um, in doing your work in Hawaii rather than doing it in Fargo or someplace on the mainland? Well, f for one thing, Hawaii, and especially the Big Island, I mean, I, I pretty much focus on the Big Island right now, but... Hawaii in general has all the renewable energy resources that pretty much exist anywhere on the planet. On the Big Island, it's 4,000 square miles. Um, it's almost the size of Connecticut. It's got elevation challenges, temperature extremes. So we have all the components that are, make it a really, really good test bed. But in addition, we've got seven and a half, roughly gigawatt hours of renewable energy potential on that island alone. And if we harnessed some of that energy, we could tackle things even like transportation with the same generation that we use for electrical generation. So when you say you have that much in gigawatt hours, are you talking just in solar and wind, or are you including it's geothermal? Or everything. Solar, wind, geothermal, okay. biomass, and also ocean technologies, okay. like OSEC. So as you know, I'm, I'm supposed to be helping the energy office look at the state, especially on the hydro. I do the hydrogen piece. You know, do you envision a time when maybe some of the neighbor islands um, would be 
exporting hydrogen to Honolulu in, on a barge or something as an energy uh, source. Yeah, absolutely. Because you have the renewables on the Big Island, and we we probably have a little scotch on renewables on this island. Yeah, I think it. You know, we've looked into this quite a bit, and with the resources available, we could be exporting liquefied hydrogen even to start from the Big Island to Oahu to help supply where the larger demand is, is obviously Honolulu, we could be supplying the hydrogen for transportation over there. And it makes a lot more sense to us to be shipping stuff 150 miles than to being bringing an LNG, for example, from Chile. So I should send a copy of this tape we're doing today to Hawaii Gas and get them going on hydrogen? Yeah, so okay. I'm, uh, I, I applaud uh, Governor Ige's decision to, to, to not go with LNG. And uh, I think it's the smart way to go because it's an expensive infrastructure to put in that could be put to renewable energy technologies. Okay. Well, you and I are hydrogen junkies, so we're going to save that for the end of the show and finish <laughs> okay. off with that. But we'll, we'll talk about that one later. But, um, you know, on the Big Island, um, there's, there is a lot of potential for renewables. There's a lot of potential for doing what you're doing. And there's also some unique challenges. You've got great distances. You've got a lot of properties that are, probably would be better off off the grid than on the grid because when you're trying to push the power through a long wire to one farm or one ranch um, that's that's a lot of infrastructure to support a small number of facilities so would would you kind of encourage I mean how would you look at the Big Island as a as a, a community and say where do you really need grid and where where should you be pulling off the grid or, or does it make sense to come off the grid or do you really need a grid on the whole island like Hawaii I think the future, the grid in the future is going to look pretty different than it does today. And we had a, lo a very long discussion last night at the West Hawaii Energy Forum in Kona. Um, a lot of the solar companies were there uh, representing the, the solar industry. And where the resources are available to do renewable energy, it makes sense today and it makes economic sense today to actually go off grid. Uh, renewable energy is definitely lower cost now than in the grid power. The other reason is if you were just saying sometimes the infrastructure just doesn't work. There are places on the Big Island that are so remote and so rural that the cost of just bringing the power to that area is cost prohibitive. And in those areas, doing off-grid with battery storage and solar makes a lot of sense. So I think the, it's just like the electric cars and the fuel cell electric car debate I think there's going to be a mix in the future, except that the grid as we know it is going to be a much smaller grid because we really believe that distributed generation is the future. So grid generation can become more of a series of microgrids instead of one large grid. Uh, I agree, it doesn't make sense pushing power all the way over a mountain and having huge losses that you're burning fossil fuels especially for. It's just totally wasted. Great. Yeah, so I look at Oahu and I go, there's probably a lot of places on Oahu that could come off the grid, but places like downtown Honolulu, high-rise apartments, industrial areas, um, those seem to be well-suited to stay connected to a grid directly. But could we even do distributed generation within that really focused grid in, in downtown Honolulu and in the industrial area? Does that make sense from your perspective? I think in the future, um, just like in Okinawa with the small housing demonstration, uh, buildings could actually share power. Um, if, if geothermal energy were more um, prevalent on the Big Island and hydrogen were shipped over, it could actually be hydrogen that could power a lot of these buildings with fuel cells. Great. So I think we're going to see a, a big advance in fuel cell technology in the next 10 years just due to nanotechnology and material sciences. Okay. Well, we're going to take a quick break and we'll come back in a minute with uh, Paul from the Big Island. And uh, we'll actually take a little tour through his facilities and show you some pictures of what, where he works and the building he designed and how it all fits together. See you in, see you in 60. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on Think Tech Hawaii. Center Stage airs every Wednesday at 2 o'clock, and of course you can check out our archives on YouTube or on Think Tech Hawaii anytime you like. Why should you do that? Because this is an arts show that I believe is making a difference in lives. We talk with uh, artists of various ilk. We talk with 
painters and, and writers, playwrights, novelists, poets, sculptors, dancers, um, you name it, directors, uh, uh, actors, of course. And we don't on only talk about what people do, but we talk about how they do it. And my favorite part of the conversation, we talk about why they do it. And it's really common on this show to hear people say, wow, I didn't think about it that way. And it's very common to hear people afterwards who have seen the show say the same thing. And I hear all the time that people are inspired by the conversations that we have. So why don't you join us and be inspired too. That's Center Stage on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock. We'll see you Center Stage. Hey, welcome back to Stan the Energy Man, and welcome to my lunch hour with Paul Pontio from the Big Island Blue Planet Research. And we're going to throw up some photos here and, um, and talk about where Paul works and, and the facilities he has on the Big Island. So I don't know if we can pull that first photo up. Yeah, there we go. That's the one I wanted. That's the uh, photovoltaic array. It's actually on the south-facing roof of his building. So that's actually the roof of his building. But it gives you an idea when we started talking about uh, designing your structures to, to be efficient to begin with, um, that's kind of where we start with this thing. So I'll let Paul explain some of the efficiencies in, in his structure. Yeah, so like you said, that's, that's an 85 kilowatt array of PV, and basically that building becomes the utility for the entire ranch. Um, inside, the building is, is very energy efficient. Because we're at 3,000 feet, we don't need air conditioning. But during the summer months when it's really hot, the building actually has passive cooling. So there's a continuous vent that runs up at the, the end of the eave, and it allows any heat buildup that does take place to go out of the, the building. Right, so this, this is a south-facing roof line. And if you, were go to, if you could go to the other side of the building, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of the other no. side. There's actually, that's it. The roof basically goes up to the peak there and has probably a little return down on the other side. but but it's pretty much open, so the hot air that rises inside just heads to the top of the structure and then vents out the, the windows on the other side of the building. And so what's our next photo in here? So we, I think we got um, the next photos. Oh yeah, the, the Millennium Rain, um, the Millennium Falcon, the, the Millennium <laughs> Rain unit that um, dispenses hydrogen. So why don't you talk a little bit about um, Chris's um, equipment and, and what you do with the extra electricity that you generate from your PV array. Sure. Um, first of all, this is a company called Millennium Rain, as you said, uh, Chris McWinney in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, this, what you're looking at here, is a compressing all-in-one fueling station. So it stores six kilograms of hydrogen, it compresses it up to 6,000 PSI, and on the right side there's a door that opens up and there's actually the J2600 nozzle that goes on fuel cell vehicles and anything that actually uses gaseous hydrogen, compressed hydrogen. So, so Hank, Hank Rogers is ready to hook up his Mariah up there as soon as they deliver it, right? We'd like to get a Mariah as soon as possible. Okay. So I actually drove one last weekend, so it was, it was pretty fun. Okay. Uh, but the concept, there's the electrolyzer. We used to have it inside of the lab. It's been moved to a dedicated building now. But um, the concept is if you go off grid, there are times when you're going to have excess energy. There's just no way around it. You can only store so much into batteries. In our case, we have a particular issue with a microclimate as well. So typically by 11 o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock noon, we're overcast. So we have to grab all of our energy early in the morning and store it. So in the mornings, we have more energy produced by the roof than we can actually put into the loads and to the battery storage. So that's where hydrogen comes in. So the, the, the can we back up one, one photo? That's, that's the battery right there. So that's let's talk a little bit about the battery. So the previous slide was a hydrogen generation. So first of all, you top off these batteries, and when you got them topped off, then you make the hydrogen, right? Actually, the, the, the size of the array is such that we can actually be charging the batteries and do the hydrogen okay. at the same time when it's Great. sunny. As the clouds build up, we back off on the hydrogen and let the batteries finish. Uh, the batteries are, are typically fully charged. Um, th those are Sony lithium iron phosphate batteries, and they're typically fully charged by about 10.30 in the morning. Okay. So. <clears throat> and then what's the next photo we got here? Is, uh, well, that's your shop. So as a machinist, you had to build a shop, right? <laughs> right. So we have a little machine shop where we have uh, basic machine tools, engine lathe, little CNC milling machine, and all the hand tools necessary to make 
components and anything that we need. That was actually a little fuel cell we were demonstrating in that slide right there. Uh, and it was from Ballard. I think it's a two kilowatt or 1.5 kilowatt fuel cell. Uh, that was quite a while back. Yeah, this is an old photo, I think, from last year. Yeah. But one thing I didn't bring a picture of was your um, stationary fuel cells that you have opposite. So, so you've got the photovoltaic array. Mm -hmm. It charges up your batteries, those black Sony batteries, and then makes hydrogen. You store the hydrogen outside in some big propane tanks and also in Chris's um, Millennium Falcon um, <laughs> operation. And um, get, it, get it ready there, Millennium Rain uh, dispensing uh, unit. And so you're ready for vehicles and you have the hydrogen as, as stored energy. Mm -hmm. But now you need power back in your building at night. So say, say the batteries are starting to run low because everybody's doing their laundry and watching TV and, and doing everything they can. The batteries are coming down. And you get to that point where like rut row, we're, we're running low on battery juice. Then you have the stationary fuel cells that kick in, right? right. Okay. So how do, those, how do those actually work or what do they, what do, they do for you? Okay. Um, the batteries are our primary storage, the first line of defense, so to speak. If the batteries do get down, which is rare, but it happens when we experience really bad weather the afternoon before and they start discharging early and wake up in the morning and it's raining again. So if the batteries do get below, typically around 10%, the stationary fuel cell kicks in using the stored hydrogen in the low pressure tanks that you've mentioned, the 1,000 gallon propane tanks. and that charges the batteries. Everything goes through the battery, so the battery becomes a buffer, and that way you can absorb spikes and loads when motors turn on and things like that. So the fuel cells will keep the batteries charging, and once the sun comes back up and the batteries start to charge, the fuel cell shuts down and waits for it to happen all over again. So your batteries need to charge. They don't charge and discharge at the same time, but you actually can have one charging and then shift to the other one, or can you charge and discharge? It's it? almost simultaneous. Okay. I mean, it, it, it can go it's pretty seamless. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Nanosecond. Okay. What's well, the next photo that we have there? I think we have one or two more left. We had one. I know we had one in there, the last one. Yeah, there, oh, there's um, oh, Roy. Roy McAllister. I wanted to, to throw him in there and let you talk a little bit about Roy. Great. Yeah. You want me to yeah. Yeah, Roy, Roy is one of my mentors and uh, one of my heroes. Roy founded the American Hydrogen Association. He's probably the most knowledgeable person that I know of with internal combustion engines and hydrogen, and hydrogen in general. Uh, Roy's got more patents than, than God, I believe, and uh, he's demonstrating right now one of his patented spark injectors. And this allows you to run an internal combustion engine on hydrogen and do it very efficiently and without making any NOx emissions. And that's the, the reason that um, this is important is, you know, we mostly talk about hydrogen fuel cells as the technology we'd like to go to. Yep. But there's always that, how do we get there from here? Maybe that's a bridge too far. So maybe instead of jumping right to fuel cells all at once with everybody, this may be a more cost-effective way for the, the moral majority of us to transition to hydrogen power is to use that technology that Roy was demonstrating there um, to, to move into things, even, and even for farm equipment and other things. Oh, as well. ab absolutely. Right now there are 1.2 billion roughly internal combustion engines on the planet that are contributing to greenhouse gases and climate change. If we were to start converting those over, which by the way are low-hanging fruit, mm -hmm. the ex infrastructure exists right now, we could turn those into actual air cleaners because hydrogen uh, actually cleans the air under a certain type of combustion regime like stratified charge. So cities like Beijing who can't see the sunrise or sunset uh, could be cleaning the air with the same infrastructure that's causing the pollution. Great. So let's talk a little bit about Roy's, that, that equipment he had there. Yeah. Could you kind of explain to us why that, that, particularly, uh, that particular unit that he patented, you know, kind of tell us how that works uh, in general terms. That, yeah. that even I could understand. Sure, sure. The, uh, an oversimplified version is basically that you have two types of combustion in internal combustion engines. Uh, homogeneous charge where the fuel and air is all mixed together before it enters the combustion chamber. Uh, that typically creates the perfect stoichiometric mixture to burn the fuel. In other words, it has just the right amount of air necessary to combust the fuel. In a stratified charge, the fuel is injected right into the cylinder at the moment of ignition. 
So you don't throttle the air back, so you're not starving the engine for oxygen, in, and it gets all the air it needs, and the fuel combusts more cleanly, and in particular, the most significant thing <coughs> is that it produces no NOx emissions. Now, even if you burn hydrogen in a conventional engine, in a conventional type of charge regime, you get NOx emissions. Okay, so, so basically though, when, when you have a traditional tr uh, internal combustion engine, when you introduce the fuel with the air, mm -hmm. you're basically diluting down the fuel, or yeah, you're, you're taking up space uh, with, with fuel that should normally be air or oxygen that, right. that would give you the, the most uh, yeah, bang and the fuel doesn't bottom. burn completely. Right. It, it, that's why we have catalytic converters on, on our vehicles right. to clean it up. So Roy's technology um, sucks in all the air it can yep. into the cylinder and then at the last second as the cylinder starts its compression uh, stroke or as it's, as it's, it's going actually in there. over top dead center as okay. it's coming down. You fire in the fuel and then it ignites yep. and that injector and the igniter are the same yes. basically the same thing exactly so he's doing this on diesel engines which are high compression engines so is, is, that, well. is that is that better to do it in a diesel engine than a traditional gas or they well, both work really well well they both work well but I mean diesel engines are high compression to begin with they're also a, a much better quality engine they're built sturdier um, but even the internal combustion gasoline engines that we drive today can be converted over so when do you think that Mr. McAllister's technology is going to kind of take root and go? Do you, do you think, I mean, you're really, really close to that, or is, is he, like, waiting for patents or stuff to settle down, or does he pretty much have it ready to go into production and he's ready to rock and roll? Yeah, we're working on trying to get into production now. It's, it's been proven in the, in the labs and in field tests for a number of years now. So the next step is to actually go into a small-scale production to do a validation demonstration and we'd like to do that on the Big Island especially and then after that step would be to actually go into commercial production of making these. Yeah, one of the things that I find in my in my job at HCAT is that there's a lot of work going on in a lot of places, a lot in the national labs but then there's a lot of small private you know not-for-profits and other labs doing work and they do talk to each other but a lot of times if it's proprietary and they're going to turn into a business, they, they don't really want to share a whole lot until the right moment. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they know they have their business model down, they have their production ready to go before they share all that technology. Yeah. And what I see on the, when you go through the national labs is you, you're kind of, it's out there for everybody to look at. You got yeah. peer validation and, and all kind of analysis going on that's in public. But a lot of the folks like kind of working on the private side and keeping things quiet so that they know they've got it down, they know they've got it fixed to the, and they've worked all the bugs out, and they're, they're, they have enough of business savvy and enough uh, business moxie with it, with the investing and everything else to get it to the production stage and get it to the commercial stage without sharing all their technology with the world and then putting it out there. So that's kind of what he's trying to do then. Well, he's, he's trying to do that, but I mean, IP value has to be protected to some degree, but Roy is one of the few people I know who his main mission is to give this to humanity. Okay. And I think a lot of those ideals are changing today. If you look at Toyota right. uh, and even Tesla, they both opened up over, well, Toyota has opened over 5,000 patents to all of the manufacturers. Mm -hmm. Because if, if the industry as a whole doesn't succeed, no one succeeds. That's true. That's true. So that's that's pretty different from the way it was back in you know the early days of the automobile and the competition between General Motors and Ford and everyone else. So yeah, we're going to go to a break in a few seconds. But before we do that, I want to I want to just you know bounce one thing off you and let you put in your two cents. They, the one one thing that I hear all the time is hydrogen's the fuel of the future and it always will be. But I don't see that right now. I see things happening in hydrogen. Why don't you give us 30 seconds on whether you agree with that or don't and why? Well, you and I both know that there's been more movement in the last year or 18 months than probably the last 10 or 15 years combined. So I'm feeling really positive. Uh, Toyota has basically bet the farm on fuel cells. Mm -hmm. uh, Honda, Hyundai, all the major car manufacturers are doing it. Europe is, is probably a little bit farther ahead than the U.S. is going to be. Um, they have more of a, a need to do it than we do uh, with the oil. So I think 
from everything we've seen and what we're seeing ourselves personally, that there's more momentum and more progress being made now than ever before. So it's, it's kind of like the little GM commercial or, or the ad that you've seen where they have the rear view mirror, the side mirror, and it says objects in the mirror are closer than they appear and there's a fuel cell vehicle in there. Uh, okay. So I think we're there. All right. I don't think it's stoppable at this point. Okay. Well, we're going to take a quick break and be back in 60 seconds. And we'll talk more about our favorite subject, hydrogen. Hi, I'm your host from Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward to, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia. And by Asia, we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world, uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. And we're here talking to Paul Pontio, and we're going to saturate you with hydrogen right now. We're going to we're just going to talk about hydrogen because we're both hydrogen junkies. And like I tell people, my grandparents' generation thought Hindenburg when you said hydrogen. My parents' generation thought H-bomb when you said hydrogen. And those are bad things. We don't want that to happen. My generation goes, can you smoke it and get high off of it? And the answer is no. Um, it's, you don't want to smoke it. You don't want to snort it. You don't want to do anything like that with it. But it's non-toxic. It's around in everything we've got. What I'm happy is that the young generation they get it. They study it. They work with it in school. They're not afraid of it. So my challenge is to get the three quarters of the people on the planet that think Hindenburg and H-bomb and get rid of them, get rid of those thoughts, banish those thoughts, and talk about hydrogen the way it should be, which is as an awesome element that can give us the energy that we need, store the energy we need, and do great things. So Paul, let's hit them on hydrogen. What, what are some of the things you'd like to see us do in the state of Hawaii for the next few years in hydrogen? I think building the infrastructure is key, but before we do that, as you just mentioned, one of the biggest obstacles to hydrogen, it's not the energy cost, it's not the storage and the compression of it, and it's not the lack of infrastructure, it's the lack of real information about hydrogen. There's so much misinformation that people are scared of hydrogen uh, for no good reason, and it's just basically from not understanding hydrogen. One of the things we do at the Blue Planet Research is give tours. We give tours to schools, we give tours to businesses, to the government. Um, and the goal is to educate people about the safety of hydrogen, the uses and the applications for hydrogen, but mostly to get them past that Hindenburg syndrome. And uh, we talk about that almost every group that comes through, at least one person brings that up, if not the hydrogen bomb. So dispelling that misinformation and that fear is key. And every person who comes there and sees that hydrogen is not as dangerous as everyone thinks goes and tells 10 people. So exponentially it spreads. It should be taught in the schools at some point. Uh, we've had issues with schools being afraid of hydrogen, mm -hmm. science-related schools. Uh, it's a flammable gas. Uh, it has to be handled with respect, like any flammable gas. But as flammable gases go, it's probably one of the safest. And one of the things we do is demonstrate how safe it is with a little wok burner. And we'll do that on another show. We'll That'd be to, great. Yeah, we'll at least bring a video of that and show uh, the lack of radiant heat in the flame because there's no carbon in hydrogen, mm -hmm. uh, how hard it is to actually ignite it compared to what people think, mm -hmm. and uh, just talk more about the, the realities of hydrogen and we can talk about the Hindenburg and what really happened to some. Okay. Well, uh, let me share a little story that happened uh, a weekend or so ago with my wife. We happened to be on the Big Island, and my wife got a tour of Blue Planet. <clears throat> and this is, this is around the hydrogen wok burner. And Paul, what he does is he turns on the, the hydrogen almost full blast coming out of this burner. So you hear the gas hissing out of the, out of the burner thing. And he's got his little lighter, and he's just standing there talking for like 30 seconds. Every second that he talked, my wife took another step back and another step back because she's afraid when he lights this thing off, the whole room's going to go up. So Paul lights the lighter and holds it about two feet above the hydrogen burner, 
and you can see the hide the flame of the lighter flickering from the gas going past it but it's not igniting it's that safe just a, a couple feet above the gas it's already dispersed in the air so much it won't ignite so he turns the volume back down on on the hydrogen so he's not putting so much out and he puts it down and he lights the the flame right next to it and that's when you see it you go oh my god it's it's not going to blow up it's not the room's not filling with this obnoxious gas that's going to ignite and tear the roof off my 85 kilowatts of PV and everything. <laughs> it's it's yeah, really yeah. not that scary. Right. And and it's that epiphany that happens with people who have never worked with hydrogen before that really has to get across to everybody. But you're right. It's that's a tough that's a tough nut to crack. I run into it all the time. Yeah. People are just scared to death of hydrogen and for no good reason. So and, and when I first started working with hydrogen. I mean, I, I was programmed like everyone else. Me too. So I was extremely cautious. I mean, I still am, but uh, I, I learned what the limits are and how to respect it. And it's not as scary as people think. Uh, the main thing as you were describing with the gas going up, it's theoretically hydrogen has the widest range of flammability of almost any flammable gas. It's 4 to 75 percent, basically. But in reality, to actually get it to ignite, it's more like about a 25 to 30 percent concentration. And coming out as a gaseous form, uh, it's dispersing so quickly, like you said. At 45 miles an hour, it's going up. It's 14 times lighter than air. Um, it's really hard to get it to light. The other big myth about hydrogen, uh, especially with people who, who tend to think they know a lot about hydrogen, is that it burns invisibly all the time. Well, it only does that out in bright sunlight. Indoors or at nighttime, hydrogen actually burns with an orange, bluish orange flame, so it's visible. And that's just what you want for cooking. Yeah, and you know what? That's another point, too. A lot of people forget that you have more than one sense. And when somebody says the flame's invisible, mm -hmm. they think that they're, they're just going to go walking through a room, and if there's hydrogen burning, they're going to suddenly combust because... <laughs> But no, it makes noise, it hisses, I mean, coming out of the burner, you've got more than one cue that there's something going on there. You're not just going to walk into a room then, and suddenly ignite yourself because it's got hydrogen burning in there and you can't see anything. There's a lot of visual, other visual cues, including the orange or just mm -hmm. the heat waves, yeah. you know, things like that little cue you. There's something going on there. It's not, it's not like some mystery thing where you're going to walk into a perfectly clean room and just ignite yourself right. because it's invisible, quote unquote invisible. Yeah. So it really, you got to use all your senses, and if you, like you say, if you're reasonable, you understand the principles, the properties of the of the gas, and you and you follow the safety yep. thing that comes along with it, it really is great to work with. And I know when we when we train with the fire department, because we had to train all the federal firefighters. Mitch Ewan brought some training out for mm -hmm. the federal firefighters when both of us had have stations on federal installations. They had to be trained. By the time they finish the training, they go, "Well, we'd rather deal with this than gasoline." Yeah. You know, it's, it's a whole lot safer than gasoline, but we think nothing of driving up to, you know, the gas station and sticking the nozzle in and fueling up our car ourselves, you know, and that's actually pretty dangerous. In fact, right. I saw a, a YouTube video that said there's 3,000 fires at the gas pump every year, you know, with people either lighting a cigarette or, or something. Static charge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cell and set, phones. Set and setting things off at the gas pump. Um, and so far, I don't hear too much about hydrogen, but, you know, I'm sure somebody will figure out how to screw that up at some point. And we're just trying to keep that down to a dull roar until everybody gets the, the picture that this really is pretty safe stuff. Yeah. So what are some of the other things on the big on that you think about? Well, let's just say, you know, we talked a little bit about hydrogen on the grid because, you know, we, we like to look at hydrogen and transportation. But, you know, you talked a little bit about distributed generation mm -hmm. and, and the, the advantages to that. So um, kind of give us a feel for how hydrogen could be used as a load and combined with a fuel cell, how it can actually work in a big grid, like a Honolulu grid, more than right. a big island grid, to help HECO balance their load and also give us some hydrogen for the transportation sector. Sure. Kind of paint us that picture. Yeah, I think one of the things people think about when they, when they talk about hydrogen, especially for electrical energy storage, because hydrogen is not a free fuel source that you find somewhere and you can't dig it up out of the ground. It's just an energy carrier, so it, it's more like a battery thing is that it's more useful than a battery in some ways, and it never self-discharges. As long as you don't let it leak out, the energy stays forever. So even though the efficiency of round-trip hydrogen making it and going back to electricity again is very low compared to other things like battery storage, 
it's still easy to scale it up to large, large sizes where batteries are difficult. And with batteries, we've seen large multi-megawatt scale batteries. When an accident does happen, it's pretty catastrophic, like the Kahuku fire, for example. But wind to gas is a concept that's being used uh, in Europe right now in a lot of ways. Even taking excess wind power, electrolyzing water into hydrogen, and then taking carbon dioxide from coal-fired power plants, for example, you can make methanol. And methanol becomes an energy carrier, with, which is mostly hydrogen. So you can use reforming fuel cells to turn that liquid carrier back into electricity. It makes storage much easier than compressing the gas. In Europe, they're also putting it directly into gas lines that can be distributed all over. You can actually separate hydrogen out of natural gas and methane once it's been blended in. Um, so I think on the big island, we have an opportunity. You know, we've got some of the best, well, we actually have the best wind regime in the whole world in Lalamilo Valley. Mm -hmm. It's as high as it gets on the chart. So we have the best wind resource. We also have major geothermal resources. And those are all key to be able to produce hydrogen affordably, low cost of energy. If you were making hydrogen just with Helco's utility power or HECO's power, it wouldn't be cost effective because of the cost. But wind farms, geothermal, all are curtailed at some point. So there are times when the loads aren't great enough to export that into the grid, and that's an opportunity to store it in the form of hydrogen. And that, if you know, for the first time in history, we have this opportunity to actually use that same electrical generation infrastructure to make not only electricity, but also our transportation fuels. Okay. So that's significant. All right. So, you know, when, when you listen to the governor and, and uh, our goal to be off of fossil fuels for power by 2045, mm -hmm. and you understand that with all the renewables, you have to have some kind of storage. Um, I know that I've seen uh, studies by Enroll that say 20% saturation, you've got to have something besides batteries for energy storage. So that, that technology and that, those research tools have already been established, and we're at that point right now. I mean, unlike the rest of the U.S., when it comes to per capita, per capita solar, we're there. We're yeah. close to the 20% saturation point. Right. So isn't it about time that HECO starts looking at other storage besides battery storage when you start to talk megawatt and higher scales? And, you know, how do you envision that <clears throat> happening, like, especially on Oahu? I know you kind of focus on the Big Island, mm -hmm. but, but we need more energy on Oahu than we can probably generate realistically off of big solar farms. But if we could allow more rooftop solar and then have a few solar and wind farms, we could probably get real close to generating our own power and some uh, transportation fuels as well, right? Yeah. But do you see hydrogen as the key or just one of the, the keys? I think it's one of the components. Uh, there's no magic bullet in any of this stuff. I mean, this is one of the things that, that we try to teach people and explain. Um, at the ranch on the Big Island, we have really only re one resource, and that's solar. But if we had wind, it would be added to the mix. Uh, on Oahu, you have opportunities for offshore wind. So you could produce a lot of power. It's windy here. Mm -hmm. This whole state has good wind. And offshore, it would you have lots of real estate to put in even floating uh, wind turbine stations. So you could be generating a lot of power. And at times when it's, uh, the loads are such that the, the grid can absorb it, great. At times when it can't, it can be dumped, dumped into hydrogen. OK. Well, believe it or not, <clears throat> we've blasted through our time, our allocated <laughs> time here. And so we're definitely going to have to have Paul come back and talk to us some more and do my hydrogen fix for me for another month sometime. But uh, we're glad to have you here, Paul, and thanks for sharing what you're doing with um, Hank Rogers on the Big Island at Blue Planet Research. And that'll wrap it up for this week. And uh, stand the energy man, so we'll see you next Aloha Friday with more energy stuff. Aloha.